Howdy doody, duties. Well, we've been talking about what does the Bible really say, and every now and then someone asks me one of the dumbest questions. On the other hand, I kind of think maybe I give the dumbest answers to the best questions. But I was asked, where's that statement that says that the Lord saith that a tub shall sit on its own bottom? Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Well, in Jeremiah and in Ezekiel, that's kind of a philosophical uh, books of the Bible, and they, they say a lot of things that could be interpreted that way, but they do not say that particular statement. That was a statement that Teddy Roosevelt made a few years ago. A tub's going to wind up on its own bottom because he was talking about being self-reliant, being yourself. You know, when you really come down to it and you're going through the Bible and you get to the books of Chronicles, and that's where all the, they list all the doings of the kings and the rulers of Israel and how they, they made their mistakes, and boy, they made a bunch of them. But when you come right down to it, it didn't affect our modern civilization as much of the, as the kings of Europe did. So we, we put a lot of different stock into a lot of different things. But the truth of the matter is, when you think about the Bible, after you get through the Old Testament and you get into the New Testament, and that's about the life of the one person that actually made a bigger influence on all of us, all countries everywhere, than any other person that ever lived. I'm talking about Joe and Mary's little boy, Jesus. And I'm talking to you now about you and how things happen. Oh, look, well, you know, last week we talked a little bit about old Jacob and, and Isaac and, and, uh, and Esau. Esau and Jacob, as you know, were the uh, sons of, uh, of uh, Isaac and, and, and Rachel. Uh, that's quite a love story, too, about Isaac and Rachel. We'll get into all that as time goes on, but I wanted to talk to you about how what goes around comes around, basically. You know, take old uh, Jacob when he met Jabin, uh, the father of uh, his intended bride, why, uh, actually, it, it was kind of funny. Uh, old David had, had two daughters. He had Leah, ugly as a mud fence. And then he had uh, Rachel, which was a doll. She was really got by ba boom you know what I mean? I mean, she was something special. Uh. Well, he wanted to, he fell in love with old Rachel. And incidentally, a while ago, I said, uh, Rachel was his mother. It was Rebecca was his mother. I get excited when I get to this love story because of all the love stories I've ever read anywhere, the one in the Bible about uh, old Jacob and, and Rachel is probably the best that ever was. Well, Jabin, he was a crafty old man. You know, he, he got back to, at old Jacob for tricking his daddy Isaac and tricking him and, and getting the uh, lands and everything. But he wanted to marry him. Rachel, he wanted her for his own, so Jabin says, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. You work for me for seven years, and you can have my daughter as your wife. So he did. He worked for him for seven years. And she comes out, and there's a custom of the time, you know, you got the bail on and everything, and they do the big, uh, big old wedding, and they have the wine and the food, and then when he takes the veil off, he finds out it was double ugly Leah that he married. He didn't get old Rachel after all. <laughs> See, you know, what goes around comes around. But so Jabin wanted to be fair. He said, tell you what I'll do. Tell you what I'll do. I'll let you work another seven years, and I'll give you Rachel. You can have them both. Why anybody would want double trouble, I'll never know. But he figured, all right, I'll marry old Rachel. And so he did. He worked another seven years. But here's where the story gets interesting. So sure enough, they have a big wedding, and he marries the girl of his dreams, which is Rachel. God, he's happy now. And of course, as is the custom, in those days, with the daughters comes a dowry. You know, you got to pay somebody to take a woman off your hands. And so 
He oh devil he gives him you know his dowry. Well, this is the funny part now. When Rachel and Jacob leave, they take all the good livestock and leave old devil with nothing but the sick ones and the scrawny ones and the bad ones. So I guess they got they had their moment of getting back at him too. You know, a lot of people say, well, the Bible makes a lot of things about revenge and about uh, taking an eye for an eye, all that. Well, those statements are in the Bible, but it was man's way of handling things more than God. God is nothing but pure, genuine love. And that's what God is. God is love. So many times they have interpreted the word in the Bible, love, is to be fear. They say, fear God. There is no reason to fear God. God is love. So what that means is love God. But you know, you got to remember that the boys that did the Bible and the interpretation and, and the editing of the Bible, they did it with a, with a little bit of... Uh, little bit of politics involved. They wanted to help themselves is what they wanted to do. The rulers that were doing that. And that means all the way from the high priest down to the lowest politician. They wanted to make it fit so it made their ruling a lot easier. It made them, it's kind of like the corporate managers today. They don't do things for the employees. They do things for themselves. And that's the way it's been, and that's why it's a little difficult to understand what the Bible really says. But I found one thing. You get a really good spiritually inspired person, or a really good spiritually inspired book, and you may think you're changing it, but that little thread of truth is going to run all the way through it. And you'll be able to follow that thread of truth, you'll be able to look at that thread of truth, and if you're wise and you let your own spirit come through, you'll get all the truth out of it. Now, nowhere in the Bible does it say to be a dirty rat fake, although a lot of us are. I've certainly had my share of it. But what it does say is to love, and to love your neighbor as yourself, and to love God, and God loves you. And God loves you so much that he let you make mistakes. He let you fill in the, all the details of your own life. And that's real love. No interference. You know, that happens a lot in, in married couples and kids that get into relationships. One or the other wants to rule one or the other. They want to say, well, if you'll do this, I'll love you more. Mm. Or if you'll do it my way, I'll like you better. Mm. Or because you're doing this, it's so much better. Amen. Well, <laughs> what they're doing is they're telling the other person to make the same mistakes they're making. Think about that. If everything was perfect, why would they want a wife? Why would they want a husband? They'd just stay by themselves. Look in the mirror, that'd be enough. <laughs> but it's not. Because we share. Why even, let's go back to old Cain and Abel. Oh, Cain says to God, hey, when God says, hey, where's Abel? Cain says, am I my brother's keeper? And God answered him, you're damn right. Gotcha. Everybody's, everybody's keeper. Everybody's, everybody's friend, brother, and one in spirit. And that's the truth about this whole thing. Not only do we love each other, we got to work together to get things done. What in today's message OTN was talking about oh. how how uh, how you gotta get up on other people. You know, nobody really ever does anything alone. You think about it. You can't even make a living alone if it isn't someone out there buying the product, someone out there paying for the service, you ain't gonna make a living. That's all there is to it. So we're standing on each other's shoulders. We're helping each other in every way. And the more you help someone else, the more you're helping yourself.